Hi, this is Kendall Boyson, professional life and recovery coach, and you're listening to Encouragementology, the practice of instilling hope. Hi there. Thank you so much for joining me. On this show, we're going to do better than just survive. We're talking about thriving, growing, developing, prospering, and flourishing. If you feel stuck in a cycle of barely getting by or through each day, turn up the dial. You don't have to succumb to simply existing. There are tools, strategies, and connections that can help change your state of mind and put you back in control. Before a captain goes down with the ship, you better believe he tried everything to alter the course before that happened. Have you tried everything? I'm going to lay money that the answer is no. Logistically, you can't really try everything since you're always growing and changing as your circumstances change. There is always something else to discover and learn. So stick with me as we shine a light of inspiration. It's going to take you, so all I can do is inspire you to want to try again. Ready to plug back into your power to thrive? Let's think back and try to pinpoint the moment you started losing your fight. If we're going to apply a new strategy, we need to know at what point you switch from thriving to just surviving. Remember a time when you thought you could own the world, young, wide-eyed, and full of hope. Anything was possible and you were determined to try everything. At some point, life started pulling ahead, and instead of jumping up and down on the top of those 72 stone stairs at the Philadelphia Museum as Rocky did, you are looking up thinking, there is no way, and I'm just going to stay here at ground zero. What is holding you back physically or mentally? For me, it was losing myself in the process of trying to control everyone and everything around me. I would consider myself strong and fiercely independent. I'm a problem solver and tend to think strategically. That doesn't mean everything in my life has gone to plan or that I've always had the right answers. My awakening has come through trials and tribulations. Because I don't submit to being emotionally down, I've tried to learn something from every challenge and failure. Definitely the right recipe to strive for, but that doesn't mean that I haven't repeated the same patterns over and over. I was convinced people needed me. Not the type of need that comes from being stranded on the side of the road and needing a ride, but the type of need that lends itself to control. I thought people needed me to survive. As a result, I spent a lot of time, effort, and energy trying to control and fix others. Now, even the most efficient multitasker would have trouble managing this schedule and putting themselves first. The math just doesn't work. I had nothing left for me. To look at me, you wouldn't have noticed it, as I'm sure it's the same case for you. You might look like you have it all together or even like a real superhero dashing in to save the day. But the journey of life is filled with lessons and opportunities. And if you're focused on everyone but yourself, you may find yourself very far behind. You've been too busy pushing everyone else down their path that you've barely taken a step on your own. So for me... Deciding to thrive instead of just survive meant I needed to make a life-altering commitment. I had to commit to allowing others to live their lives, good, bad, or ugly. My commitment included stepping back to give others space and time to learn from their own choices. Guess what? Everyone is on their own journey And far be it from me to control their path based on my own expectations. Wow, that was a real awakening for me. Once I was able to let go without the fear that everything could come crashing down, I could turn my attention to myself 
and I had a lot of catching up to do. a story of Caleb that mirrors aspects of my own told by Christine Hammond, a licensed mental health counselor with over 1 million downloads of her popular podcast, Understanding Today's Narcissist. Caleb desperately needed a change. Thanks to a nasty, never-ending divorce, he was completely burnt out. His ex was abusive during their marriage and her assault was even worse while divorcing. Not only was the process expensive, but he lost his business as well. Now that it was over, Caleb wanted to stop surviving and begin to thrive. He knew that the process began with him, but was unsure how to start. Caleb longed for the meaningful life change that would dramatically transform his life. He was tired of feeling like the victim, exhausted from others defining him, and was ready for a significant shift in his life. Eager to start his next business venture, he knew he needed a new direction in his personal life as well. In the past, Caleb focused his energy on trying to change others instead of himself. But he was wary of that now and was willing to invest in developing himself. While it's not a natural process, it requires a substantial commitment for time and energy, and he believes the rewards are worth the effort. How does this happen? The following steps are only an outline of the process that Caleb began. The specifics need to be catered for each strength, your own strength and your own weaknesses. Number one, acknowledge the obstacle within you. This is not about accusing others of wrongdoing, minimizing others' hurts in your life, or blaming yourself for unforeseen circumstances. It's about what can be changed. You. Each person is responsible for their own behaviors, actions, thoughts, and feelings. So, take authority of your life and discover the obstacles that hold you back from being who you want to be. Number two, make a list of positive and negative characteristics. Try to discover how a positive trait can be connected to a negative one. The significant change builds off a strength that already exists in life. For instance, a person who is highly protective of their family can take things too far when protection becomes paranoia. When protection is used for reassurance and commitment, then it's beneficial. This is a time-consuming exercise, but it is so worth the effort. Number three, choose one thing to change at a time. Too often, there is a temptation to change multiple things at once, which doesn't promote lasting effects and can be exhausting. Instead, choose one item to work on that is solely your responsibility. Caleb chose to work on his anger and subsequent bitterness after the divorce. By incorporating some mindfulness exercise into his daily routine, he learned to effectively release new anger and reduce his bitterness. This gave him more energy to spend on his new business. Number four, all change will be met with resistance. To expect otherwise is foolish. This is unfortunately a fact of life. Even when a person tries to do a positive shift, such as not drinking alcohol, there will be resistance from others who used to drink with that person. Here's the key. Resistance from others is about them, not you. They don't like the change because it highlights some deficiency in themselves. You are not responsible for that. Instead, embrace the resistance and use it in a way to filter out dysfunctional relationships. Number five, recognize the need for help. One of the critical mistakes a person does is getting help from the wrong source. 
This often leads to no change and increased frustration. When there is a health issue, talk to a doctor. When the matter is more spiritual, talk with a pastor or a spiritual advisor. When it's a mental health concern, find a counselor. When it's a business-related issue, find a business coach. In all situations, it's best to get help from professionals, not amateurs. Number six, don't expect immediate praise from others. A person who needs constant affirmation from others is not changing for self-improvement. They're modifying their life for others. This is a bottomless pit, as the expectations of others can dramatically shift depending on who's present. It's also an indication of codependency or narcissism. In this case, the codependent or narcissistic traits would need to be addressed first before another change is done. Otherwise, the change is only temporary. Having successfully made a life change well should be its reward. Number seven, be patient with others. Just because a person is making considerable strides in their life does not mean that others will follow suit. Everyone has their own timeline, so give them space to go at their own pace. If others have been hurt along the way by your behavior, it will take substantial time for them to believe that the change is for real. A reasonable expectation is anywhere from six months to a year. These seven steps are merely a rough outline of what is involved in transforming from surviving to thriving. But it's a start and so worth the effort. For Caleb, his life changed drastically and he is experiencing greater happiness and contentment. How many times have you wallowed in your own self-pity, putting off change because of fear or defiance? Now, that may sound harsh, but no pain, no change. Sometimes it's just easier to stay where you are and lick your wounds, shrouding yourself in your own disappointment. Closed off, your pity can become your best friend in your comfort zone. That's just who I am, that person, that one who never gets ahead and never wins. You embrace this label and it becomes your identity. And just like hoping to win the lottery without buying a ticket, you put off what you could do today to climb out of this hole and instead you wait for your big break to come by special delivery from the universe. Remember the definition of insanity? Doing the same thing over and over but expecting a different result. Want another one? It's the thought that counts only works in certain circumstances, and this isn't one of them. Nothing changes if you don't take action. Most people are well-intentioned. They have big dreams and ambitions they want to achieve, yet day after day they find themselves stuck in the same routines and remark something like, I'll do it tomorrow. You've been there? I know, we all have. You know it can feel impossible to change your life when momentum is working against you. Having a thought uh, is not what counts here. <laughs> it's actually taking action. And I found some ideas from Reese Robertson, who is a self-proclaimed freedom addict, in an article for Medium, Good Intentions Aren't Good Enough. It can feel like you're treading upstream and getting nowhere, said Benjamin P. Hardy. Most people's environment is like a rushing river going the opposite direction of where they want to go. It takes a lot of willpower to tread upstream. It's exhausting. Instead, you want your environment to literally be pulling you in the direction you want to go. Here's what needs to be understood. Free will is contextual. Choosing and shaping your environment is at the center of what free will really means because your choice of environment and external influences will directly reflect in the person you become. Studies have shown that roughly 45% of our daily behaviors are automated by habits. You get up, you take a shower, you brush your teeth, then you head off for work, all without too much conscious thinking. 
Although this could also be a bad thing. For example, it has been found that most people look at their smartphones around 100 times per day. Yet most people believe they only look at their phone 30 or 40 times a day. At least half of those times are mindless and unintentional. They didn't actively decide to pull out their phone and get sucked into a stream of distraction, but found themselves doing it anyway. As Cal Newport wrote in his book, Digital Minimalism, few want to spend so much time online, but these tools have a way of cultivating behavioral addictions. The urge to check Twitter or refresh Reddit becomes a nervous twitch that shatters the uninterrupted time into shreds too small to support the presence necessary for an intentional life. So where is free will now? The truth is that unless you actively decide how you're going to act in each situation, you will not have free will. You will be unwittingly acting on your body's learned subconscious behaviors and patterns or succumb to the social expectations of your environment. The alternative is to decide how you're going to act and then shape your environment to make your desired behavior inevitable. Vowing, even intense vowing, doesn't work. Make a commitment instead. If you're interested, you can come up with stories, excuses, reasons, and circumstances about why you can't or why you won't. If you're committed, those go out the window. You just do whatever it takes. Until you're committed, you haven't actually decided what you want. You're still emotionally unsure and indecisive. Whenever the going gets tough, you're going to have to actively decide what you're going to do. You'll have to rely on willpower to act in your desired ways. As you've probably learned by now, willpower doesn't work. Willpower isn't actually enough, said Benjamin Hardy. If you're serious about the changes you want to make, willpower won't be enough. Quite the opposite. Willpower is what's holding you back. Good intentions aren't going to save you either. Again, vowing won't work either. The only thing that works is an unwavering commitment to the person you want to become and then immediately shaping your environment to reflect that commitment. You have to change your defaults to change your life. We live in an addicting culture. Your environment is laden with trigger after trigger after trigger. If you don't take command of your environment, your default will be a wrecked life. We all have defaults. Behavior that seems easier or natural, the difference in how we lead our lives is in the quality of those defaults. When your alarm sounds, do you hit the snooze or do you jump out of bed immediately? When you reach the kitchen cupboard, do you grab a healthy snack or do you grab chips? What if there were no chips? What if your alarm was across the room on the other side? I bet your behavior would change and in turn, so would your life. Disrupt your environment to change your behavior. We're already inclined to favor a life of ease. Don't make acting out your desired behavior any harder on yourself. Remember, good intentions aren't enough. Your free will is fleeting and eluding depending upon the environments in which you find yourself. For the most part, your actions are not going to be a result of conscious thought, but rather learned subconscious patterns and environmental expectations. You need to make a commitment. Until you're committed, you'll always be emotionally unsure. You won't really know what you want. The alternative is to change your defaults and make the right choice, the easy choice. You get to design your environment and in turn, design your life. Who do you want to be? Remember when 
we trace back to the source or moment when life started winning? Now, think about all the ways you are protecting that vision or narrative. The vision is seeing yourself on the short end of the stick, always losing. In what ways are you keeping yourself in that picture? How can you poke holes to shatter that illusion? Your narrative is what you think and say around this topic. I gave up on my dreams a long time ago. It's not in the cards for me to win. I'm too tired to give a crap anymore, so I'll just settle in and just get by. Even if you've built up your defenses to everyone around you, what are you saying to yourself? Your internal pep talk is what really counts. You have to decide that you've had enough and are ready to challenge life. What is it going to take for you to get there? Just on the other side of that door with your hand on the knob. Most of us can't go it alone. Whether you're protecting your pride or a deep, dark secret, keeping your true struggle to yourself has been your go-to default. But isolating these thoughts only give them more power over you. Our minds have a way of foreshadowing a future based on our exaggerated fears. Before you know it, you're afraid to even take any step forward. Stop. Today, stop and reach out. Reach out to a trusted advisor, friend, or a family member. Be open to positive and honest feedback. When you're protecting your pity, it's hard to hear anything on the contrary. So include your willingness to participate in your own recovery in your commitment plan. So think about this. When your car breaks down, you either know how to fix it or how to find someone who can. Emotions, on the other hand, are a little harder to fix. There's no wrench you can grab or repair shop you can take your feelings to. But you do have one tool in your kit you can always use, talking about your feelings. Even just speaking about your feelings out loud to another person can help. So why do we avoid it and believe that it doesn't work? Well, Eric Ravenscraft examines this in an article he wrote for the New York Times on why talking about your problems helps so much and how to do it. There are a lot of reasons talking about your problems can be difficult. Some people are socialized to internalize feelings rather than give voice to them. Sometimes the very emotions you're dealing with, like guilt over something you did or shame about how you think about something, can make you feel overwhelmed and can prevent you from wanting to talk. Regardless of the reason you might keep it in, talking has powerful psychological benefits that might not be obvious. Talking about it is a broad phrase, so let's clarify a bit. When we discuss talking about your problems, it could take on a few forms. Venting to a trusted friend. Sometimes you just need to let it out, let out your feelings with no real plan for a solution. I had the worst day at work can be the start of a conversation that helps you process the stress of a hard day. Discussing a conflict with a partner. Fights happen in relationships, but keeping your feelings to yourself can cause issues between you and your partner. While working toward constructive solutions to your relationship problems is always a good thing, just being able to be open about your feelings with your partner can make your communication healthier as well. Talk therapy with a licensed therapist. There's a reason people will pay money to talk through problems with a therapist. Whether you need to discuss a mental illness you're struggling with or in couples counseling to work on your relationship, just talking to someone who knows how to handle stress, a good therapist, can help you hash out your emotions. Being open about your struggles. Sometimes venting to no one in particular can help not just you, but others as well. In 2015, Sammy Nichols, a writer, started the social media hashtag, hashtag talking about it, to encourage people to be open about their struggles with mental illness. The fact of sharing what daily life has in store can help you 
and others with the same struggles realize that you're not alone and that what feels overwhelming is actually normal. What all of these forms have in common is they are conversations specifically designed to examine and express the emotions you're having rather than building a specific solution. Figure out things you can do to improve your situation is certainly good, but just verbalizing how you're feeling can in itself be part of the solution. Why does talking about it help? Getting a new job, breaking up with a bad partner, or investing in your own self-improvement are all practical things you can do to solve problems in your life. But what good does just talking about it do? When you're fighting the exhausting uphill battle against your own negative feelings, it can seem as if talking about it is the least productive thing to do. When you're feeling these very intense feelings, especially fear, aggression, or anxiety, your amygdala is running the show, the bottom part of your brain. This is the part of the brain that, among other things, handles your fight or flight response. It's the job of your amygdala and your limbic system as a whole to figure out if something is a threat, devise a response to that threat if necessary, and store the information in your memory so you can recognize the threat later. When you get stressed or overwhelmed, this part of your brain can take control and even override more logical thinking. Research from UCLA suggests that putting your feelings into words, a process called effect labeling, can diminish the response of the amygdala when you encounter things that are upsetting. This is how, over time, you can become less stressed over something that bothers you. If you got in a car accident, even being in a car immediately afterward could overwhelm you emotionally. But as you talk through your experience, putting your feelings into words, and process what happened, you can get back in the car without having the same emotional reaction. Research from Southern Methodist University suggests that writing about a traumatic experience or undergoing talk therapy had a positive impact on a patient's health and immune system. The study argues that holding back thoughts and emotions is stressful. You have the negative feelings either way, but you have to work to repress them. That can tax the brain and body, making you more susceptible to getting sick or just feeling awful. None of that is to say that talking about your problems or even talk therapy with a licensed therapist will automatically fix everything and immediately make you happy and healthy. But like eating better and exercising, it can contribute to the overall improvement of your well-being. It can help you understand how and why you feel the way you do, so you can handle your emotions more effectively in the future. Not every form of talking about problems aloud can help. Let's get that clear. In fact, multiple studies examining college students or working adults suggest that co-rumination, and we do this every day, which is constantly focusing on and talking about negative experiences in your life, can have the opposite effect, making you more stressed and drawing out how long a problem bothers you. To talk about your problems more constructively, there are a few key things you can do. First, choose the right person to talk to you. If you've ever talked about how you're feeling and it seems as if you got nothing out of it, You might be talking to the wrong person. Having a trusted friend who will support you without enabling bad habits like co-rumination can help. If you need specific advice on a problem, find someone who has faced similar problems and ideally has resolved them. And if you need a lot of talk time, try spreading your conversations out to multiple people. One person can get worn out, and having a broad social support system lets you distribute the load. Also, asking for permission to vent is so important. You need to respect the other person's willingness to listen. 
So if you just walk up and dump your problems on someone, you're effectively unloading and onloading to someone else. So choose the right time to talk. Just as important as choosing who to talk to, it's when to talk to them. Your friends may want to support you, but they have their own lives. Asking if they have time and energy to talk before unpacking your emotional bags can help you both be better equipped for the conversation. This also means being courteous about their time. Sometimes crises happen and you might need to interrupt someone, but most supportive conversations can wait. Find a therapist, even if you're not mentally ill. Therapists often have a reputation for being necessarily only if you're suffering from a mental illness, but that isn't the case. You can go to therapy if you're feeling overly stressed, if you're not sleeping well, or if you just want someone to talk to you. Think of it less like seeing a doctor and more like a personal trainer. Remember, just as with doctors, mechanics, or anyone else you hire, there are good ones and there are bad ones for you. So if you don't have success the first time, just try someone else. Give yourself an endpoint. Not all conversations about your problems need to lead to a plan of action or tangible change, but they do need to lead to something other than more complaining. Give yourself space to vent about your feelings, and while doing so, focus on how you're feeling throughout the process. If you're getting more worked up, take a break. If you find yourself talking about the same things over and over without gaining any new understanding or feeling any relief, try something else to process. You may not be able to fix the external problem that's bothering you, but the goal should at least be to improve your mood about it. Talk about the good as well as the bad. Expressing how you're feeling is healthy. Expressing yourself only when you feel bad isn't. Whether you're talking to friends, partners, or even on social media, be sure to share your good experiences and feelings when they come up. Talking about these experiences can reinforce them in your brain and make it easier to break out of negative thought patterns. Plus, it helps build your relationships with people you're close to enough to talk to. This process can still be messy. You know, some days talking about your problems may just be complaining about something that happened at work, but other times it may involve crying into someone's shoulder for an hour. It can feel embarrassing or uncomfortable the first few times, but the more you open up, the easier it will be to share how you feel. The goal for talking through your problems is not to get others to join your pity party, but to get a different vantage point. Learn from the experience, forgive yourself and others, and move on free to let go. This extra baggage will wear you down on your journey, so take the time to unpack and minimalize. You can't thrive in life when you're shackled to the past. Are you ready to break free and make that commitment today? There is a fundamental difference between thriving and surviving. Surviving means to continue to live or exist, while thrive can be defined as to grow or develop well, to prosper or to flourish. Here are some thought-provoking ideas from Tamara Lechner from Chopra.com. How come, when so many of us claim to have a goal of thriving, the majority of us are still just surviving? Perhaps it's fear of the unknown or habit. Here's the exciting part. Just thinking about a life beyond surviving puts you closer to thriving. The first step is to determine whether you're in survival mode or not. There's plenty of signs, including a fear of change. So let's check out the signs that you might be living in survival mode. You choose the path of least resistance. 
You're more reactive than proactive. You blame circumstances or others or find excuses when things go wrong. You feel there is never enough to go around. You don't speak your mind because others might disagree. You don't listen to hear, but you listen to answer. You see failure as the end result of things going wrong. Change scares you. So how do you know it's your time to thrive? Maybe you have a nagging sense that there is something bigger you're meant to do. Perhaps you want to start some self-exploration, a meditation practice, or let go of unhealthy habits that no longer feel aligned with who you are. When you get past living paycheck to paycheck and realize that you don't want the purpose of your life to be paying bills and accumulating things, then you have glimpsed the unbounded possibility of this life. So you finally realize it's time to thrive. Now what? Thriving happens when you have a life of purpose, vitality, connection, and celebration. This isn't tied to a specific salary, job title, type of car, or relationship. Material possessions are not part of the recipe to thrive. Follow these four steps to stop surviving and start thriving. Number one, know yourself. People who are attuned to their own strengths and weaknesses are more able to clearly define what they enjoy doing every day. When you spend your time learning about yourself, it reminds you how unique we all are. Some people feel revitalized after alone time, while others need to connect and share to feel recharged. When you feel your best, who is around you and what you're doing, identifying this strengthens your ability to recognize your own likes. Number two, choose to fill your day with activities that use your skills, strengths, and passions. A simple exercise is to make two lists. The first one should describe everything you do each day. The second one should list the activities that you love to do. Compare the lists and adjust so the maximum time possible is spent on the activities that benefit your body, your mind, and your spiritual well-being. Number three, surround yourself with other thrivers. When you surround yourself with colleagues and friends who have big ideas and are doing something to make them happen, it motivates you to keep moving forward with what you want. Number four, thrive physically, mentally, and emotionally. Remember to balance your life, eat well, sleep well, and make time for play. Here are some quick fixes to get you started. Think about how you want to feel rather than what you want to have or do. Remind yourself of times in the past when you felt like you were thriving. Visualize these times and remember how you felt. Make a vision board or get on Pinterest where you'll find inspirational quotes and ideas. Create a collage that reminds you of how you want to feel and what you want to do each day. Spend time every day in nature. Meditate. Take a class or attend a retreat. Grab a book by someone who inspires you. Listen to a podcast or a webinar. Do something that scares you. Change a habit. Sometimes choosing to thrive feels more difficult than simply surviving. Developing the resilience to turn crisis into opportunity will ultimately serve you in every area of your life. Remember to treat yourself with the kindness, support, and encouragement you would offer to others. Build yourself up, cheer yourself on, and never doubt for a second that you aren't worth it. Maya Angelou said it best, My mission in life is not merely to survive, but to thrive, and to do so with some passion, some compassion, some humor, and some style. 
If you want to share Encouragementology with a friend who needs to know they are not alone in this journey of self-discovery, you can visit Encouragementology.com or anywhere you stream your content to receive this episode and all others. Follow us on Facebook for additional encouragement throughout the week. So I challenge you, make a commitment to live your best life. Don't accept the status quo of barely surviving, but instead, Remove the barriers that are preventing you from challenging yourself to thrive. The path to self-discovery and your pace is up to you. I know you can do it. Thank you for listening to Encouragementology with Kendall Boyson, where we find positive ways to handle some of life's challenges. Someone through until the path was clear.